Tonight, Supreme Court shockwave. The High Court delivering a win for religious freedom and a blow to affirmative action. The High Court upholding a Christian mailman's refusal to work on the Sabbath. I was raised in a Christian family. There was no question about, you know, working on Sunday. We always refrained from working on the Lord's Day. And in another landmark decision, barring universities from considering an applicant's race in college admissions. All this and more on Faith Nation. Two major decisions from the Supreme Court. One guts affirmative action. The other upholds religious freedom. Welcome to Faith Nation. From our studio in Virginia Beach, I'm Brody Carter. We'll have more on the Supreme Court blow to affirmative action, but first in one of the most significant Supreme Court rulings on religious freedom. In the past 40 years, the, court high, the high court ruled in favor of a Christian mail carrier fighting for the right to not work on Sundays. Joining us is Abigail Robinson. She reports that the justices made clear that workers who ask for religious accommodations must receive them unless their employers can show substantial cost increase. Abigail? That's right, Brody. When mailman Gerald Groff started working for the Postal Service, he didn't have to work on Sundays. But that changed in 2013 when the service started to deliver packages seven days a week. I was raised in a Christian family. There was no question about, you know, working on Sunday. We always refrained from working on the Lord's Day. At first, Groff found workarounds like doing extra work during the week and then transferring to a rural location that didn't do Sunday deliveries. But eventually the workaround stopped working. And when he couldn't find coverage for his Sunday shifts, he'd get in trouble for not showing up. In 2019, Groff quit and sued the Postal Service for not letting him observe the Sabbath. I said, I feel like you're, you're backing me into a corner, asking me to choose if I'm going to honor God or am I going to obey you as my authority, you know, and my employer. I said, I mean no disrespect to you as my employer, but I have to choose God. Groff's lawyers argued religious accommodations in the workplace need to be observed. There's no reason religious workers should receive lesser protection than those covered by other accommodation statutes. Part of the case hinged on an interpretation of an undue hardship of an employer. A 1977 Supreme Court ruling known as Hardison established that employers don't have to meet religious accommodations if there is even a minimal burden on the business. The Biden administration argued that Groff's absences created that hardship for the Postal Service. His absences created direct concrete burdens on other carriers who had to stay on their shifts longer to get the mail delivered. That caused problems with the timely delivery of mail and it actually produced employee retention problems with one carrier quitting and another carrier transferring and another carrier filing a union grievance. According to the opinion, Groff sued under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, asserting that USBS could have accommodated his Sunday Sabbath practice without undue hardship on the conduct of USBS's business. A lower court ruled that Groff's request for Sundays off created a burden for coworkers and his workplace. But this week, the Supreme Court corrected that ruling, unanimously holding that Title VII requires an employer that denies a religious accommodation to show that the burden of granting an accommodation would result in substantial increased costs in relation to the conduct of its particular business. We are a nation where all, not just all employers, but particularly government employers, do have to be respectful of someone's religious beliefs and practice. Uh, and that might mean having to work around schedules for someone who observes a Sunday Sabbath. Groff told CBN News a few months ago he can't change what happened to him in the past, but he's hoping this ruling protects religious freedom for other Americans going forward. Brody? Abigail, thank you for that report. The court also moved today to reject affirmative action in college admissions. In a 6-3 to three decision, it overturned admissions plans at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote for the majority and said the two programs violate the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. In a dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote that the decision rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress. President Biden said he strongly, strongly disagrees with that ruling. Today's court decision is a severe disappointment to so many people, including me. But we cannot let the decision be a permanent setback for the 
Biden went on to say that colleagues should evaluate how candidates overcome adversity. Former President Trump called the decision a, quote, great day for America. The high court has upheld race-conscious college admissions twice in the last 20 years. Well, joining us now is Nick Reeves. He's an attorney with Beckett Law, and he joins us now for more analysis. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brody. Well, first, starting off with Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Katanji Brown-Jackson, both writing scorching dissents to the court's decision to reject affirmative action. Sotomayor writing, quote, the devastating impact of this decision cannot be overstated. So what are your thoughts on this ruling and those dissents? Uh, you know, well, Brody, I, I think um, it's it's difficult to say for sure what this is going to mean uh, for higher education. Um, but I think it's uh, it's important to uh, you know focus on on what the majority what the majority said and where the majority was going with this. Well, Nick, President Biden joining in saying this decision can't be the last word. Nick, do you think that this ruling will make it easier or harder to take into account adversities that students have overcome? I think it's pretty difficult to tell uh, what this what this means going forwards. Well, you and I talking prior to the show here that the unanimous decision was a key turning point to this. Can you kind of expand on that for our viewers? Sure. I, I think uh, the Supreme Court's decision today in, in Groff was uh, was a big win for religious liberty. It means that the government and employers have to accommodate religious employees uh, unless it would be a substantial burden on their business. And that's a, a big change after 40 years of allowing uh, employers and businesses to cite trivial or minor costs to deny religious accommodations. Were you surprised at the unanimous decision on this nature? You know, I think it's it's always hard to say after oral argument, but I think it was somewhat surprising, but a very good sign from the court. I think it was great to see all the justices coming together to agree that religious accommodations in the workplace and protecting religious freedom for employees, uh, you know, was something they could agree on. What about unintended conduct, excuse me, unintended consequences, Nick? Do you see anything happening from this opinion? Um, you know, I think the, the court has had a long time to think about these issues. This is not the first petition to go to the court. Uh, there were several other opportunities for the court to weigh in on this, and multiple justices have written separately in, in previous decisions. So I think, you know, they've given this a lot of, a lot of thought. And uh, I don't really see any unintended consequences from the Groff decision. Nick Reeves with the Beckett, uh, the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Thank you so much for joining us here on Faith Nation. Right. Well, returning our sights overseas tonight, former Vice President Mike Pence in Ukraine. He's making a surprise visit meeting with President Volodymyr Zelensky. The former VP, outspoken in his support for Ukraine, responded to criticism from some Republicans of the level of U.S. involvement in the war. I came here today to see firsthand the progress uh, that our military support has helped make possible in Ukraine. And my message to my fellow Americans as I return home will simply be that, uh, uh, that, that freedom is winning in Ukraine. And now more than ever, we need to keep faith. Well, that trip comes at a crucial moment in Ukraine after Wagner mercenary groups rebellion last weekend and in the wake of a Russian missile strike on a pizza restaurant in the eastern city of Krematorsk. Pence, now the first GOP presidential candidate to meet with the Ukrainian leader during the campaign. Joining us now is Nathan Gonzalez. Nathan is the editor and publisher of Inside Elections and a Faith Nation contributor. Nathan, first I want to start with the former vice president suddenly looking very presidential alongside the embattled leader of Ukraine. So what do you make of all of this? Yeah, it's a little bit easier, I think, for a former vice president to make this trip than maybe some of the other uh, the other presidential candidates. I don't think the the governor of North Dakota gets an uh, it's an easier ticket uh, to get there. But it is a political uh, risk for the former vice president. As you laid out, uh, this trip may not have been very controversial six months, nine months ago when Zelensky was viewed more as a hero for for helping you know, his country stand up in the face of invasion. Now there's a, there is scrutiny on the Republican side about Zelensky as a person or how the money that the U.S. has sent over and the, and the um, and equipment that they've sent over, is it being used properly? And this is a time where Pence can't afford very many mistakes in a presidential race when he's essentially trying to knock off an incumbent in the primary in, in his former boss. 
Yeah, so Pence also issuing a statement today on the high court's decision protecting the mailman for refusing to work on Sundays, calling it, quote, another reminder that we must always appoint justices and judges who will uphold the competition, the Constitution, that is. Is this a pretty good day for Pence on the campaign trail? I guess, Brody, but this is a pretty standard uh, standard response. This is how a, a normal conservative Republican, I think, is going to respond to this decision. I don't know that it distinguishes him from the rest of the field. Pence still has primary problems in that he he's too close to Trump because he was vice president to Trump, to people who want to turn the chapter, and he's not anti-Trump enough uh, to to people, or he and he's too uh, he's not Trump enough for those people who do like the former president and are do want to continue those policies. So the the path is still difficult for Pence. Well, we're on the topic of President Trump here. So Trump today applauded the Supreme Court's decision. Do you think this fight over affirmative action will become an issue in the race for the White House, or will it be long gone by 2024? It's it's a big decision. I would say it's even a historic decision, but not a politically consequential decision because I think you'll have a lot of Republicans cheering on the decision, most Democrats uh, expressing their frustration with the decision. And when we get to the general election, I think there's going to be it's going to be more about the economy and inflation and gas prices, abortion to ax, uh, abortion. Uh, access and those issues rather than this particular decision. Yeah, a lot of chatter on social media today from Democrats, especially President Biden spoke out today on the Supreme Court ruling rejecting affirmative action, saying, quote, this is not a normal court. Could we see calls to pack the court and add term limits for justices turning into a campaign issue for Democrats? Uh, I think Republicans will bring that up as a possibility. Uh, the D Democrats are going to do that. It, it always comes up. I'm skeptical unless there's actual action and movement in that direction. I also don't think that the the president, President Biden's comments are particularly helpful when you're kind of you're eroding trust in an institution. I believe we all benefit from trust in the institutions. And, and there's a way to disagree on the ideology of the court, the current court makeup, without going at the, the actual institution itself. Most definitely. We appreciate your time, Nathan Gonzalez, as always. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Brody. Well, new data shows a stronger than expected economy. Coming up after the break, why some economists still fear a recession is on the horizon. Even with strong numbers in today's jobless claims report, the Federal Reserve is signaling another interest rate hike. And that has economists worrying over a coming recession. This week's jobless claims dropping, showing a still strong job market. Unemployment claims last week coming in at 239,000. That's 26,000 fewer than the previous week and down from a two-year high. Continuing claims for unemployment benefits dropped by 19,000 with 1.7 million workers receiving unemployment. Well, Mark Hamrick is a senior economic analyst and the Washington Bureau chief at Bankrate. Mark, how much of a factor is the steady job market in the Fed's upcoming decision to employ another round of interest rate hikes? Pretty good to be with you. Uh, the good news is we still have about another six weeks or so before the next Fed meeting. So they'll have a lot of data yet to mull over, but you're right, they have set the groundwork for the possibility of not just one, but two more rate hikes of one quarter of 1%. The job market is obviously part of the consideration in the sense that the strength of the job market uh, has proven more resilient than the Federal Reserve itself would have expected. And that aligns with the persistence of inflation that has lasted longer than expected. But also uh, economic growth has proven more resilient than would have been expected by now. When we think about the fact that the Fed started raising interest rates in March of last year. Well, most definitely. Here next week, uh, we're going to be seeing the Labor Department's June jobless report. What are you expecting there? Yes, this will be the employment report that tends to be, at least in non-inflationary times, the most important economic snapshot of the month. Uh, and the expectation there is that uh, we'll see moderating job growth, not quite as strong hiring as what we saw in May with 339,000 jobs added. The consensus here, roughly around 200,000, which would be, I would say, normal during non-pandemic, post-pandemic times. And then we'll see the unemployment rate holding steady at 3.7%. 
I think we need to view that unemployment rate in a bit of a historic context in the sense that we have risen ever so slightly from the more than 50-year low of 3.4% that we had in April. Uh, that matched the same level we had in January as well. So uh, we cannot say that the unemployment rate is elevated, but uh, to the point of uh, your comments at the outset, uh, we have seen jobless claims and continuing claims rising, and that's consistent also with the many job cuts and job cut announcement we've seen since the beginning of the year. Uh, those have uh, been led by the technology sector. Well, the dreaded R word, Mark, recession, it's been tossed around and depending on whoever you talk to, we're already in one or it's right around the horizon. What are your thoughts on this? Now, Brody, we have not uh, met the technical definition of a recession here and a reminder of that uh, just today with the revision of first quarter GDP at essentially par or average an annualized increase of 2%. And that's essentially what the expectation is for the current quarter, the second quarter, which is about to end as we flip the calendar from uh, July, June to July. I think about the quote that's been attributed to Mark Twain with respect to the predictions of a recession sort of being, you know, one day away effectively. And that is uh, when he said that reports of his death are premature. Uh, we will inevitably have a recession. The question is when, and the fear is, of course, that if the Fed does continue to essentially unleash the ammunition against inflation, which is higher than uh, is acceptable, uh, that that does raise the risks of a recession. But to the earlier points, persistence of growth, uh, the, the continued relative strength of the job market, uh, those things argue against at least the imminent uh, nature of a recession. Well, thanks for that insight, Mark, here. Bidenomics, real quick, less than 30 seconds here, uh, talking about this becoming an insult, then turning into an asset. Biden trying to transition that uh, into the upcoming campaign trail. Do you think this is a risky strategy? I think there's some risk in it. It sort of reminds me of what we talked about during the Clinton administration years ago about triangulation, essentially trying to embrace an argument, in a sense, uh, from your opponents and, and try to make it an asset. But the more he, he sort of tries to embrace ownership of the economy, which, let's face it, a president does not own the economy, although there is that notion of the buck stopping at the White House, then if anything goes wrong, then he's blamed. So uh, there, it is it is a bit risky. And the other part is in this polarized political environment, I think there are only so many people who are going to be swayed one way or the other. Some think he's doing a good job. And that's a minority based on polling and others who are going to blame him for the current situation. And there are going to be a lot of people who are, aren't going to be swayed one way or the other. Most definitely. We'll buckle up for that uh, anticipated next interest rate hike. Mark Hamrick with Bankrate, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, coming up, New York gives providers a workaround to ship abortion pills. Why critics say that puts women in danger. Coming up. Welcome back to Faith Nation. Doctors in New York are now allowed to ship abortion pills out of state. New York Governor Kathy Hochul signed legislation this week that will shield doctors from legal action for sending abortion pills into states with abortion bans. That law expands abortion access via telehealth with little to no legal consequences. More than a dozen states have effectively banned abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last year. Well, joining the conversation is Dan Steiner, founder and president of pro-life organization Preborn. Thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Uh, first off, I do want to jump into why this legislation potentially could be dangerous to women. Well, we're talking a major medical procedure, these abortion pills, and it's not under the supervision of a doctor, an OBGYN. And so here's specifically and anatomically why it's so dangerous for women. This is actually abuse for women. If a woman takes the abortion pill and the fertilized baby moving from the... Um, moving down the fallopian tube to the uterus uh, from the ovaries has not made it to the uterus and she takes the pill that will stop the movement of the baby in the fallopian tube. That's called an eptopic pregnancy. That is a very dangerous thing. It's very, it can, in most cases it's fatal. Woman bleeds out on that. And the only way to know is with the doctor's visit as to where the baby actually is in the gestational cycle um, before administering the pill. And in fact, that is written on the abortion pills box. There's a warning on there. And to make matters worse, if a woman has chlamydia, and by the way, 60% of all sexually active women do have chlamydia, sexually inf transmitted infection, and it is not symptomatic. So they don't know they got it in most cases. 
Uh, there's a warning on the abortion pill box itself that says that it will quadruple the likelihood of an eptopic pregnancy. And so this is a very dangerous uh, procedure that needs to be done under the supervision of an OBGYN. Of course, mail order pills to their mailbox that their bathroom becomes the abortion clinic doesn't afford that protection to women. And that's, in fact, while the Alliance for Hippocratic Oath yeah. uh, protested the thing in the first place, it is a neglect of the Fed Food and Drug Administration's yeah. statutory duty to protect these women. And a lot of people don't take into account those physiological implications. But I do want to ask you if states that have banned abortion pills, do, uh, do they have anything that can legally stop these prescribed abortion drugs from coming out of state? Yeah, um, certainly they could take legal action against the distributors of the pill if, in fact, they caught them. Uh, the problem is that if a woman has an abortion, she's probably not going to report it. If she has complications, they tell them to not tell them that it's an abortion, but to tell them that it was a miscarriage. And so they tell them to lie. And then to make matters worse, Rody, is that there are sanctuary states where they're pushing out these abortion pills over the Internet that are protecting people that do the illegal action of sending abortion pills into states where it's illegal. Let's say, if you're caught, we will not extradite them, California being one of those. And so it's just a very difficult yeah. proposition to actually catch them and then for states yeah. to cooperate. Well, Dan Steiner, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. But thank you so much for joining us. It's our pleasure. Well, still ahead, a Yankees pitcher achieves perfection. Next on Faith Nation, a closer look. And finally tonight, a pitch-perfect performance. That title belongs to Yankees pitcher Domingo Harmon, who made Major League Baseball history Wednesday night. The right-hander tossed a perfect game in an 11-0 win against Oakland Athletics. It's the fourth perfect game in Yankees history and the 24th in Major League history. But what's putting this one in the history books? Harmon, the first Dominican-born pitcher to throw a perfect game in American and National League history. Well, that's going to do it tonight here for Faith Nation. We we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow.